Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Lynette Roth and I am Daimler Curator of the Bush Reisinger Museum and also the head of the Division of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Harvard Art Museums. And I am very pleased uh, to welcome you today uh, to our program. Before we begin, uh, the Harvard Art Museums acknowledge that Harvard University is situated on the traditional and ancestral territory of the Massachusetts people. And we at the university strive to honor this relationship. I'm pleased as always to see so many of you turn out for this week's session of our series, Art Talks Live, which offer an up close look at works from our collections with our team of curators, conservators, fellows, and students. And you can join us on Zoom every other Tuesday at 12.30 PM for these short interactive talks. And in these talks, we investigate artists' materials and techniques, reveal our latest discoveries, offer a fresh look at old favorites, and explore big ideas using the collections of the Harvard Art Museums. So just logistics uh, before we begin, in case um, somehow you have not been Zooming uh, for the last uh, 12 plus months, uh, we are using the webinar format in Zoom. So you can submit your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And the presenters today will speak for about 15 uh, minutes or so, and then we'll dedicate uh, the end of today's time to the Q&A. Uh, so go ahead and put those questions even in the Q&A box uh, as the presentation is ongoing, and we're going to end promptly uh, today at one o'clock. So I am very pleased today to welcome my colleague, Sarah Lorson, Alan J. Dworsky, Associate Curator of Chinese Art at the Harvard Art Museums. And Sarah oversees the Chinese art collection as well as Korean paintings and decorative art and South and Southeast Asian Buddhist art. Uh, Sarah's research interests include Chinese archeology, span digital humanities, technical art history, collecting history and contemporary Asian and Asian American art. And I should say that Sarah joined the Harvard Art Museums during the pandemic. And I'm really looking forward um, to our reopening uh, this fall and to getting to spend some time with Sarah in the museum and with the collections. Um, but today, here we are, uh, thankfully virtually. Sarah's talk is uh, today is part of a series related to a museum-wide initiative entitled Reframe. And that project reimagines the function, role, and future of the University Art Museum. And if you're interested, this series, uh, which is ongoing, will run through mid-June and examine difficult histories, foreground untold stories, and experiment with new approaches to the collections of the Harvard Art Museums that reflect the concerns of our world today. So I'm very pleased to now welcome Sarah. And also, as you will see, she has some uh, co-presenters with, with her today. Uh, but with that, I, I turn it over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Lynette. And thank you for everyone for joining us today. Um, now, before I jump in, I'd like to begin with a little thinking exercise. Imagine for a moment that you're standing in the early Buddhist art gallery whose floor to ceiling or to ceiling windows look out onto the balcony over Broadway. This is a popular spot in the museum and people often take a seat on the bench or stand in quiet contemplation. Facing the windows, there's a wall with a slightly recessed square in the center. In front of it sits a stone Buddha surrounded by stone relief carvings mounted in wooden frames. The lower two reliefs depict figures with their hands pressed together in prayer and above them are figures in fluttering robes. Now, before you take a step forward and read about them, what would you want that label to say? What do you want to know more about? So I'm gonna give you a minute to type your answers in the Q&A box, and then Lynette's going to share some of them with us. Okay, Sarah, um, when and how they were created. Great. Uh, where are these from? Mm -hmm. What is the material? Uh, who removed them from the caves? Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, many saying, where did they originate from? Uh, and what else was shown with it? Uh, who is depicted? 
Uh, and it also questions about the creator, uh, in which era it was, uh, the works were made, how old they are, what region they're from. Terrific. These are all great questions. And I see we have so many questions coming in. And indeed, there are a lot of questions to ask about these objects. And these are precisely the kinds of questions uh, that don't fit in a 150 word label that we set out to answer in reframing Tianlongshan, a virtual exhibition that falls under the larger umbrella of the museum wide reframe initiative. Over the last year, the public's perceptions and expectations of the museum have changed. And one priority that's emerged is an increased need for transparency. That is the need for us as curators to communicate to you, our visitors and online audiences, the history that our of our institution and our collections and the thinking behind our curatorial choices. I hope that reframing Tianlongshan will tell you a more complete story about these fragments. We'll share a, a preview link at the, of the site at the end of the talk, uh, but this will remain a work in progress. As new resources, information, and tools become available, we'll continue to share them with you on the site. So today I'll start by explaining how this project came about, who's been involved, and what our objectives were. Next, I'll share some of the research and digital resources presented in the exhibition. And finally, you'll meet the team of students who are instrumental in creating this resource. When I joined the museums remotely about a year ago, I was asked if I'd like to work with students to curate a virtual exhibition, and I jumped at the chance. I could not have asked for a better prepared or more dedicated group of students, and I'm also deeply grateful to the staff members across the museum who contributed in countless ways. As for what this site was going to address, my first thought was to investigate these objects. The collection contains 25 stone fragments from the rock cut cave temples at Tianlongshan. I had passed by them many times when I worked on an inventory of the collections nearly two decades ago, but they were often overshadowed by our more famous temple fragments from uh, Dunhuang. As it turned out though, they had been studied and scanned as a part of the Tianlongshan Caves Project, which was begun at the University of Chicago in 2013. This ambitious project had located fragments all over the world, determined their sources, and digitized them, oh, sorry. providing us with excellent data, photography, and 3D models. Their hard work uh, provided the foundation for reframing Tianlongshan. The objectives of our project were to present a more holistic picture of the history of these objects, both in the period of their creation and in their afterlife as artworks transported to the United States. To increase transparency about how these objects reach the museum. To create a pilot program for working with students to investigate the original context and provenance of other groups of cave temple fragments in the collection. And to think through ways to reinstall cave temple fragments in the future. So let's begin with a little bit of context to orient ourselves. The caves were made during a period of turmoil in China that is sometimes called the Six Dynasties period, although there were in fact closer to 40 dynasties during this roughly 400 year period. We're going to focus on the Eastern Wei Dynasty in the sixth century, which is highlighted here, because the majority of our fragments come from caves constructed in this period. It was during this time of near constant warfare that Buddhism was introduced to China. Buddhism is a religion that originated in India and it centered on the teachings of the Buddha, a prince who had renounced his wealth and achieved enlightenment in the fifth century or fourth century BCE. You can usually recognize him by his simple robes and the bump atop his head representing his vast wisdom. After his death, Monks and devotees spread his teachings throughout Asia. One of the earliest forms of architecture associated with Buddhism is the cave temple. In India, monks used natural caves as meditation spaces because they provided protection from the elements. But by the second century BCE, they had begun to carve out new caves to create elaborate spaces for meditation and worship, 
like these early caves at Baja near Pune. This practice spread from India to Central Asia and into North China by the fourth century. Tian Longshan, or Heavenly Dragon Mountain, is located in the semi-arid northern province of Shanxi, just outside the city of Taiyuan. In the Eastern Wei period, this city was called Jinyang, and it was the secondary capital of the dynasty. There are 25 cave temples high up the mountain, spanning two south-facing cliffs. Construction took place between the 6th and 10th centuries, and a few more caves were added at the base of the mountain centuries later. Let's look more closely at the Eastern group. Most of the Eastern caves date to the 7th and 8th century, but the earliest, including caves two and three, which are highlighted here in yellow, were made in the 6th century. 22 of the fragments at Harvard come from these two caves. So why were these caves constructed? Unfortunately, we don't know for certain. In general, Buddhist cave temples in China were made for one of three reasons. First, like their precursors in India, they were used for meditation and worship. Second, they were sometimes erected by rulers for political reasons, such as to display their piety and legitimacy over their subjects. Finally, the creation of Buddhist images or monuments was believed to benefit one's karma or the actions in life that determine your future rebirths. Once a cave was created and activated, it could go on producing positive karma for its patron indefinitely, whether it was used or not. Caves two and three have similar layouts and are both roughly eight feet square. Karen Gauch at the Harvard Art Museums has used historical photos of the site to reconstruct the interior in a program called SketchUp. Notice the figure placed outside the cave for scale. These are small structures and leave little room to move around. Niches are carved into the north, east, and west walls, and the ceiling consists of a central square framing a lotus blossom surrounded by four sloping walls. The trapezoidal slopes are carved with apsaras, female celestial attendants seen here in fluttering robes, holding bowls. Each wall niche contains a central Buddha surround, surrounded by semi-divine beings called bodhisattvas, who are often pictured with long flowing hair and elaborate robes and jewelry. The interiors were dark and must have been viewed by candlelight. A few areas of the walls were not photographed and are now damaged, so it's impossible to know how they were decorated. Another mystery is how they were originally painted, but studies at the Strauss Center have shown the use of white, green, and red pigments. How then did these 22 fragments from caves two and three come to Cambridge? In 1918, Japanese archeologist Tadashi Sakino uh, rediscovered the site, bringing it to the attention of scholars and collectors all over the world. The site was later visited by Asian and European art historians, as well as by an Asian art dealer from Japan named Sadajiro Yamanaka. In 1927, Sakino convinced the Japanese government to buy up fragments like stone heads and hands, which locals had begun removing from the site to sell to foreigners. Yamanaka was tasked with selling them in the name of preserving these important artworks, and he published a catalog in 1928. Yamanaka and company had shops and clientele in several cities in the United States, and the demand for these fragments must have been quite high because his subsequent sales were of considerably larger pieces of the site. There are no publicly available records of how, when, or by whom these fragments were removed, but they caused irrevocable damage to the site. This is the east wall of Cave 2 today, and you can see where the reliefs, standing bodhisattvas, and apsaras were chiseled out. Harvard's Tang Dynasty Buddha, seen seated on the left, came from Cave 21. And we have an invoice indicating that it was purchased for $25,000 in 1936 by Harvard alumnus Frenville L. Winthrop. Winthrop had studied under Charles Eliot Norton, the first professor of art history in the United States, and he became a passionate art collector. 
Winthrop surrounded himself with more than 4,000 objects, which he was constantly rearranging in his Manhattan townhouse and summer estate in Lenox, Massachusetts. Upon his death in 1943, he left all of his art treasures to Harvard's Fogg Museum. In the last configuration of the collection in the townhouse, the Tianlongshan fragments were of central importance to the first three rooms of the house. Upon entering from 81st Street, a visitor was immediately greeted by two reliefs of the Buddha's disciples in the entrance hall. The next room, the outer hall, contained 20 fragments. I've matched up archival photos of the interior of Winthrop's home and made a partial photosphere to give you a sense of how it would have felt to stand in the outer hall, surrounded on all four sides by the reliefs, which were mounted in wooden frames on pedestals. Can you imagine the impression this would have left on visitors almost 100 years ago? Most of these objects are believed to have been purchased from Yamanaka and company, but conclusive evidence in the form of financial records or correspondence has not been located for all of them. The remaining three reliefs are visible surrounding the doorways on the right side of the inner hall. There are currently no digitized photographs showing the reliefs on display in the Fogg Museum but we hope that some will come to light when the museum reopens and access, access to the archives resumes. In 1985, Harvard's Asian collections were transferred to the newly opened Arthur M. Sackler Museum at 485 Broadway. There they were displayed in different arrangements in the fourth floor galleries, as well as on the fifth floor in the Rubel Asiatic Library and the hallway approaching it. At this time, the fragments retained the original wooden mounts and pedestals, and several in storage still have them today. In 2014, the Fogg, Sackler, and Bush Reisinger Museums were unified into a single building at 32 Quincy Street. In the early Buddhist gallery, fragments from three different cave temples were displayed together as though they were a cohesive group. But the design did subtly capture other elements of the original context. The Apsaras were positioned floating above objects that were originally located closer to the floor, and the recessed square evokes the interiors of the caves. Early designs also removed the Apsaras frames, but two concerns were raised about this proposal. First, the Apsara reliefs were difficult to read at a distance and lacked visual cohesiveness without their frames. And second, the frames actually offered a great deal of structural support, particularly for reliefs that had been broken into pieces and cemented back together. The decision was made to keep the frames, but to add veneers so that their wood would match the rest of the room. Our group has given a great deal of thought to these objects in this space, and we've asked ourselves, what is the museum's responsibility as the home to the largest collection of Tianlongshan fragments outside of China? What stories are we obligated to tell? What does it mean that we presented something fragmentary in a way that makes it appear complete? Where is the line between aesthetics and accuracy? My feeling in this moment of institutional self-reflection is that as much as possible, we should group together only objects from the same cave and that we should unframe them in order to reframe our thinking about them. Student guides and board members have suggested using line drawings to more concretely connect them to their original archeological context. Without their frames, the fragments cease to be independent works of art and they become pieces of a now missing whole. It will likely be several years before we can carry out any reinstallation work but that will give us time to consider fragments from other cave temples as well. And now I would like to turn it over to team Tianlongshan so that they can tell you more about their experiences working with these objects and how this project relates to their studies. Michael will tell you about his master's thesis work in an area close to the caves and the importance of recognizing regional connections and styles. Caitlin will discuss her work in classes and at the museum around the early history of collecting Chinese art in the United States. Finally, Sophie will talk about how she has used digital tools to uncover patterns over time 
and across large distances. So Michael, would you like to begin? Thanks, Sarah. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Michael Norton, and I'm currently a second year PhD student in the History of Art and Architecture Department here at Harvard. And my work primarily focuses on early medieval Buddhist sculpture. My interest in this project stems from fieldwork I completed during my MA at Tsinghua University in Beijing, during which I researched modular sculptural works contemporaneous with those of the early phases of Tianlongshan, so primarily the first third of the sixth century. Um, specifically, my master's thesis addressed image pagodas from a place called Nanyoshui, a site located at the geographic intersection between four major cave temple complexes in northern China, including Tianlongshan. These experiences informed the work that I did for this project, um, which included primarily writing about the historical circumstances of artistic production at Tianlongshan in the medieval period. When any of these sites are discussed, we often run the risk of inadvertently fixing them in geographic and temporal isolation from their surrounding world. The materiality of the stone medium itself suggesting a permanence that belies the malleability of form and processes of movement and migration, all of which inform the creation of Tianlongshan and its related sites. Moreover, the way in which the cave temples of Tianlongshan have been disassembled into fragments, which in turn have entered into museums and private collections, further complicates the matter, as these historical forces have dislocated these objects almost entirely from their original installation setting, as Sarah has pointed out. As an internal space in which all surfaces are the support matrix on which religious imagery can be represented, the cave temple and its attendant meanings are fundamentally about the totality of that pictorial context. To see an isolated fragment in a museum does allow a viewer to appreciate its beauty and craftsmanship, but one is deprived of the opportunity to understand that fragment through the dialogues in which it would have participated in its original context. It is the hope that this project in some ways addresses this fictional stasis projected onto Tianlongshan, demonstrating to viewers that the site was, through all phases of its history, dynamic and able to respond to both the aesthetic and socio-religious demands of its moment. And I just want to close by thanking our leader, Sarah, for all her work this semester, and as well as my uh, two collaborators, Caitlin and Sophie. It's been a pleasure working with everyone. Caitlin, would you like to go next? Hi, everyone. I'm Caitlin Howe, and I'm a senior undergraduate in the History of Art and Architecture Department. And I focused on the collection history of the Tianlongshan fragments and its institutional history at Harvard where I researched specific figures like the art dealer Sadajiro Yamanaka and the collector Grenville L. Winthrop. And I'm also a student guide at the museums where I had previously been researching Harvard's collection of fragments from the Dunhuang Caves, which has a similarly complicated past. My tour discussed the controversial removal of these fragments and Harvard's involvement. And after every tour, I take an audience poll and received overwhelming majority response advocating for a candid discussion and collaboration between Chinese institutions and the Harvard Art Museums to study collecting histories. And we need these discussions so we can learn from the mistakes of the past and avoid them in the future. And we should also tell the public about them. They're sincerely interested in understanding the museum as a place where mistakes happen and complicated decisions are made. And as a researcher interested in modern and contemporary exchanges between East Asia and the West, I did not expect that ancient objects like from Tianlongshan would provide insight into modern issues like colonization, imperialism, and even race. The Tianlongshan's fragments removal illustrates the complicated power dynamics between China and Japan in the 19th and early 20th century, and later between the US and Japan through World War II. Japan's involvement in the removal of Chinese objects occurred against the backdrop of Japanese imperialism and China's political disarray. And then following the attack on Pearl Harbor, the US government seized and liquidated the businesses of quote unquote designated enemy countries, including Yamanaka and company. And finding these fascinating and unsettling stories was a real joy for researchers like me. And it was such a pleasure working with my classmates and Sarah on this project. And I sincerely hope for future projects like this to continue to occur. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Sophie? 
Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Sophie Lei, and I'm first year master's student in the Regional Study East Asian program. So besides my interest in and work on based the formation and of uh, collections of Chinese art in the US and early medieval Buddhist art part of this project, along with my wonderful um, collaborators, Kaylin and Michael, I'm particularly attracted by and focused on the digital humanity aspect of the Tianlong Shan reframing projects, especially during the time of pandemic when accessibility to the actual sites and objects are limited. So reframing Tianlongshan, as Sarah said, is a project that has mixed temporality and spatiality when we consider the different lives of the objects. Their lives at different caves in Tianlongshan from the 5th century to the 10th century, and their afterlives after they were carried out of China and distributed all over the world. And digital tools like geographic information mapping and JS timeline can help us visualize large quantities of data, such as the global distributions of the fragments, and can also help us uh, produce a clear progression of events in a multimedia way, such as um, using timeline to create, um, to illustrate the complex and nuanced collecting history of the Tianlongshan fragments. So in this project, we use the data gathered by the Tianlongshan case projects at the University of Chicago as a starting point. And from there, I have created a digital maps that display how 155 pieces are distributed in North America, Asia, Europe, and over 10 countries through density points. And clicking on each point allows visitors to further interact with the map and get more information about specific fragments or its collections. This map is still on the progress, but will be integrated into the site. So from this project, I also learned about different levels of accessibility of digital tools within the institutions. A zero digital learning tool such as JS Timeline sadly could not be embedded directly because of accessibility issues. This project prompted me to think about writing and creating digital tools in a more public-facing way. And I found this process of building a website and brainstorming about insertion of certain digital tools was I think invaluable to me. I greatly appreciate this wonderful opportunity to work with my classmates and Sarah on this really meaningful project. And I look forward to future projects like this. Thank you, Sophie. I think we have time for a couple of questions. We've run a little bit late. Lynette, is it okay if we go a few minutes over? Yes, uh, it is such a rich topic and um, it was really wonderful. Thank you so much, Michael and Caitlin and Sophie for uh, sharing with us uh, very briefly uh, your uh, incredibly deep uh, research and the collaboration on the online uh, exhibition together with, with Sarah. So um, we will uh, take a few minutes now to have a question and answer period. And while um, Caitlin touched on this uh, a bit in her comments, there was a question uh, about uh, Yamanaka and the um, circumstance under which um, he was able to access and remove the fragments and sculptures. So maybe just a few uh, more words about that. Sure. Um, a lot of this history is somewhat incomplete. Uh, there is an archive of records that belongs to um, the Yamanaka company and family in Japan. In fact, the Freer Sackler actually recently had a public program devoted to Yamanaka um, and how deeply he's impacted collections throughout the United States and Europe. Um, but we don't know a lot of details specifically about how objects were removed. Um, this was a period of intense warfare in China, the, the 1920s and especially the 30s. Uh, there was very little centralized control. And so even though some of the first cultural property laws were introduced in the 1930s, they weren't very well enforced. Um, and there was a lot of um, exporting of cultural property in that period. Um, we have um, actually another uh, question uh, for the students. Uh, how has working on this project changed how you see museums and museum collections? Does anyone want to jump in? Um, I can share a little bit of sort of my experience coming at it from uh, this perspective of, P of a PhD student, wherein I think our work often stops um, right at the moment of collection. So we talk about everything but um, what it means for an object to enter into 
um, the stores of an institution and what that means for its storytelling. We sort of talk about what something might mean, how it was made, its materials, all of those more traditional aspects of art history, um, but don't always, as we should, be acknowledging the complicated histories that are attached to that act of collecting. And so I think working on this project, you know, it's not something I, I've considered as readily as perhaps I should in my own research, but what does it mean to take an object or to take a carving out of a sacred site, put it in a collection, and how do we bring that into our research? Um, so I think it's, an, it's important to really be reminded of those, um, those problems in our work and what we haven't yet discussed in our academic writing. Well said. It's great. Thank you, Michael. And it is, you know, it is uh, the challenge. And of course, Sarah addressed it at the outset in increasing, you know, wanting to increase uh, transparency around these issues. And I think your uh, shared project today really shows how actually an online site, an online exhibition can help um, us have a, a format for uh, these uh, more complicated discussions and as Sarah suggested, and I think that um, was, was very uh, interesting, Sarah, to, to hear that you really are thinking long-term about a reinstallation of these objects and other objects from uh, cave temples in the future. Yes, there are many more groups to look into. Uh, we have a lot of questions actually very specific um, to the uh, cave itself, uh, whether it's still an active site, um, and uh, what do we actually know about the artisans who would have uh, made uh, the work initially? These are great questions. Uh, we don't know a lot about the artisans. Um, something that uh, Michael really pointed out in his research and his part of the site was um, the interconnectedness and the fact that um, because this was located at the secondary capital, there was a lot of movement between the primary capital and the secondary capital. And some of the artists might have been moving from one site to another. Um, so the, the stylistic similarities we see between these works and others in the region are not coincidental. Um, so these could have been entourages of artists um, moving um, from place to place. As for the activity of the site today, um, I have not visited myself, unfortunately, as one of the few cave temples I haven't been to yet, but I have seen in contemporary photographs, there are often offerings made in front of the Buddha, um, you know, a flower in a vase um, or some small thing laid out um, on a little blanket. Um, Michael, you, you've been in the area more recently. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Um... I unfortunately do have not actually been to the specific site, but I visited a lot of um, regional smaller sites that are um, connected to this cultural milieu. And as Sarah says, often um, local residents of some of these smaller sites will uh, place small offerings, sometimes fruit, sometimes candles, often incense. Um, some of the sites also have um, donation um, receptacles where, where monetary offerings could be made. Um, so they still sort of exist within um, the sort of religious and, and spiritual practice of the region on a small scale, yeah. So, and maybe as a final uh, question, because this project is so tied uh, really to um, the digital humanities, and I know that this is really one of uh, your um, focuses, Sarah, uh, at the museum, uh, there was a question actually for Sophie uh, about what the uh, one of the major challenges were in actually recreating the cave. So you showed you know some of these visuals that that give us a sense of of that. But uh, from a from a, a digital humanities perspective, of course, you know there's a lot of work there happening on on the back end. Um, I think I'll tackle that one because actually it was not us. It was one of our wonderful collaborators at the museum who created the digital reconstruction. That was Karen Gausch. Um, I, we've talked a bit about the construction process. Um, one of the biggest challenges is we just don't have photography, historical photography from every angle. And so there are areas that are missing. Um, Something I discovered in trying to put together the reconstruction of Yamanaka's house 
um, was that there were pictures taken at different times of the same room. Um, so unless you know precisely when a photo was taken, you might be mixing together um, images from different time periods. Fortunately, with the cave, all of those photographs were taken at the same time in 1922. Um, but also figuring exactly how they fit together. Sometimes we don't have any measurements. Sometimes the measurements are off or the line drawings are a little bit deceptive. Um, I'm sure if Karen were here, she could tell you many more challenges that she faced, but we were very happy that she could um, step in as a partner in this process. Well, and like uh, our reframe initiative more broadly, um, obviously this is a work in progress. And so uh, I know that you were going to put the link to the online exhibition in the chat. We had some requests for that as well, uh, but we do hope that you will uh, re, um, uh, will visit the online exhibition and revisit uh, the exhibition as it continues to develop um, over time. And I'm sure this won't be the last program uh, that we'll be having with Sarah on the topic of uh, the cave temples and their uh, collecting history uh, and, and also installation uh, at the museums. So thank you very much, uh, all four of you for this really thought provoking and uh, informative talk uh, and also just really wonderful to see uh, the work that is ongoing uh, with students and on our on our website uh, to address some of these key issues. I hope that everyone will join us uh, in two weeks time on Tuesday, June 1st, when we will hear from graduate student intern in the Division of Modern and Contemporary Art, Jessica Williams. And Jessica is going to speak with us about the work of expressionist uh, artist Katja Kolwitz and the impact of Kolwitz's work on the South African left. So looking forward to that. And uh, of course, please visit our online calendar for more information about our art talks uh, and all of our other upcoming programs. So thank you again, Sarah, Sophie, Michael, and Caitlin. And uh, have a great afternoon, everyone.